Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing this new groundbreaking achievement in regards to nuclear fusion. Coming out of this facility in the United States that has been trying to achieve this for decades, National Ignition Facility. And specifically, we're going to be discussing their new experiment that has actually reached a threshold where we can almost produce just as much energy as we put into it. The threshold that's usually referred to as the ignition which today represents a kind of a holy grail for the nuclear fusion. But because this is a relatively complex topic with research that's been going on for nearly 60 years now, there's quite a lot to dissect here. And I'm actually not going to be able to cover everything in this video. I am, however, going to be able to cover the important parts in regards to this experiment, and we'll talk more about other experiments in some of the future videos. First of all, the purpose of the experiment, nuclear fusion. So essentially, since the discovery that you can basically release a lot of energy through the atomic reaction and the creation of the nuclear bomb, scientists pretty quickly realized we can also use this to create a lot of energy for civil use. This was the formation of the first nuclear reactors. But all modern nuclear reactors use what's known as fission. Not to be confused with fission. Here we're talking about a nuclear process when a somewhat complex and somewhat heavy element splits into two lighter elements and at the same time releases a lot of energy, with the most commonly used element being uranium. But following the atomic bomb, the next more destructive weapon was the H-bomb, the hydrogen bomb. And in simple terms, the way that this bomb functions is by essentially using the uranium to first create the fission-based explosion that then uses all of this energy to initiate what's known as the fusion-based explosion. It essentially uses the hydrogen inside the bomb to initiate the same reaction that we usually detect inside our sun, which is why sometimes nuclear bombs are also known as the miniature suns, releasing a tremendous amount of energy in the process. But naturally, it also meant that we could hypothetically use this type of a process to create an even more powerful and more efficient nuclear reactor. Something that theoretically made a lot of sense, and a lot of scientists thought it was going to be possible within only a few decades. But this was back in the 60s. Since then, pretty much every attempt to create some sort of fusion reactor unfortunately failed, for one reason or another. And it's not that it failed because the theory was wrong. It failed because once they started building those reactors, they realized how difficult it is to maintain the constant reaction, but also how difficult it is to create a reactor where you actually get more energy out than you put into the reactor itself. Nevertheless, in the last few decades, several major theories in regards to nuclear fusion reactors have actually been proposed and successfully tested. Pretty much all of them seem to work successfully. The only problem being that the energy we put into them is still more than the energy that comes out. And of all different models and theories that are used for fusion reaction, there are two models or two reactors that are actually most well known and that are eventually believed to reach what's known as the ignition. The point at which the reactor starts producing way more energy than we use to run the reactor itself. And so what are these two main models? Well, the most popular one, and the one that's usually seen as the stereotype of fusion reaction, is what's known as the toroidal fusion reactor, also known as the magnetic confinement reactor. The way this works is on the principle of having a lot of superheated hydrogen plasma that spins really, really fast inside a very, very powerful magnet and eventually reaches temperatures and pressures that are even higher than inside our sun. And this starts producing the hydrogen fusion energy. We sometimes refer to these reactors as tokamak. And there are quite a lot of them around the world, and a lot of them have been used in various experiments for the past 60 years. Pretty much all of them were quite successful, but none of them have reached ignition just yet. But we'll talk more about this particular reactor and its successes both in the US, Europe and China in one of the future videos that's going to be coming out pretty soon. So make sure to subscribe. Anyway. These tokamak reactors are definitely extremely interesting, but in this video we're actually going to be discussing this other idea, this other type of a reactor that uses something almost entirely different. Something that was initially believed to not really work, but something that turned out to be quite effective. So instead of a tokamak that uses a very powerful magnetic coil and produces ridiculously powerful magnetic plasma, the new experiment used a very different method, a method using these tiny hydrogen pellets and a method referred to as the inertial confinement fusion. And so how exactly does this work? Well, the idea here comes from essentially seeing how it works in the H-bombs, in hydrogen bombs. When the scientists were studying the reactions inside nuclear bombs, specifically inside hydrogen bombs, 
They realized that if you were to take the hydrogen pellet and make it small enough, at some point you would only require approximately 1.6 megajoules of energy to initiate the nuclear reaction and to make it explode, producing more energy than you would actually require to put in. Because of this, they realized that there should be a way for the scientists to create a relatively simple and potentially relatively effective way to initiate the fusion reactor and to produce energy using a series of relatively powerful lasers. Lasers pointed directly at the tiny pellet that are then used to fuse all of the hydrogen inside this pellet, turning it into helium. Although, okay, quick side note, the actual process is a little bit more complicated. You obviously have to first take hydrogen and turn it into slightly heavier hydrogen, known as deuterium, because it becomes much easier for these two atoms to then overcome the electrostatic repulsion known as the Coulomb barrier. And the more neutrons there are compared to protons, the easier it becomes to initiate the nuclear reaction. And so for nuclear fusion, usually much heavier elements such as deuterium and tritium are used instead of pure hydrogen. Also, unlike in our sun, where an average atom of hydrogen can actually exist for billions of years and really not go through any reaction, in order to create practical energy out of a fusion reactor, this rate must be increased quite dramatically, which is usually done through a dramatic increase of heat and pressure inside the reactor, making it somewhat similar to some of the more giant fast-burning stars that usually go through their hydrogen really quickly. And so there's actually a kind of a requirement in temperature and pressure for a successful artificial fusion reactor. Today it's officially known as the Lawson Criterion. And this Lawson Criterion is the reason why a practical fusion reactor still does not exist. We're slowly getting closer and closer to the pressures and temperatures needed. But remember, to create these temperatures and pressures, we have to put a lot of energy in. And because of this, all fusion reactors in operation today require more energy to be put in than they actually produce after the reaction starts. And this is why after nearly 60 years, we still don't really have a functioning fusion reactor, but we are inching closer and closer to that ignition process, the process when we produce more energy than is being put in. With the recent experiment at the National Ignition Facility so far being the most successful of them all, reaching the point where we theoretically can actually say that it reached ignition, even though officially it only produced approximately 70% of energy that was being introduced into the reactor. So here is how this particular process works. First of all, the facility itself is pretty large, but the main part of the facility is right here in this little sphere. And this is what the sphere sort of looks like. It contains nearly 200 different powerful lasers, with each of the lasers being amplified by these really, really powerful devices, that are then focused on this tiny point right here. And that point contains the hydrogen pellet. And so basically all of these lasers are supposed to fire at the pellet at the same time, heating it up equally from each side, which then initiates the nuclear fusion reaction inside the pellet, turning it into a miniature sun, which all happens in just three nanoseconds. But the problem is that you have to have extremely accurate lasers and they have to produce extremely accurately measured and also extremely well controlled type of light. That's very difficult to achieve with 200 lasers. And so to kind of cheat and also make things easier, the pellets are usually put inside this little chamber that's known as the whole room. And it's meant to sort of make things a little bit easier because it ends up distributing the light from the lasers that then distribute the light turning it into x-rays that shine on the pellet pretty much equally from every side, which then initiates the reaction. So all of this theoretically works perfectly, but the problems start arising from each individual step. So for example, the fact that each of the lasers has to be amplified and a lot of them have to be shining at the same point. Also, everything inside the chamber has to be extremely accurately measured and has to be arranged in a very specific way. Also, the pellet itself and also the whole ROM have to be made with extreme precision. Even a tiny, tiny perturbation inside of one of these uh, components can actually end up producing quite a lot of different instabilities that end up reducing the total amount of energy released, mostly due to various shockwaves formed inside the pellet. And so in the past, this precision was almost impossible to achieve. But in the last few decades, we've gotten to the point where lasers are really accurate, they're really precise, they're also really powerful, as are a lot of other components used in various devices needed for this to function. And because of this, there's been a lot of progress in regards to these particular fusion reactors. And so a lot of these different inefficiencies have been slowly overcome using new technology. So for example, in the beginning, 
The actual laser amplification required a lot of energy. The laser amplification process, basically making lasers more powerful, would end up wasting about 99% of all of the energy put in. But over time, these numbers have dramatically improved, making this a lot more efficient. And so back in 2018, approximately 3 years ago, the scientists from this facility were able to achieve approximately 54 kilojoules of energy released from the pellet. Now, 3 years later, they've just announced crossing the barrier of 1 megajoule, 1.3 megajoule to be exact, which is about 25 times more than 3 years ago, and is roughly equivalent to about 80% of the energy that was being introduced into the reactor. And that is actually great news. It does suggest that maybe in a few years from now, they will cross what's known as the ignition. They will achieve the ability to produce more energy than is being introduced into the reactor. Or, in other words, they might finally have the first artificial fusion reactor. And that will of course be a great achievement. But let's not get too excited yet. There are still so many problems. One of the problems here is of course the cost. So at the moment, the way this experiment is set up, the reactor can only fire once per day. That is not going to be enough to power anything. A functioning fusion reactor that's going to be powering a city is going to have to fire these lasers pretty much every second. The other issue is with the cost and the production of pellets. They have to be manufactured using extremely precise methods. And so each of these pellets is sort of expensive. But they have to cost only a few cents for this technique to be viable in producing energy for a city or a country. And also replacing these pellets has to be almost instantaneous. Although previously one solution to this has been proposed as a kind of a droplet system, where the pellets basically just drop from somewhere on top, and as they descend they are ignited to produce energy and then the next droplet is introduced. Nevertheless, even if such system is developed and we find a way to make these pallets relatively cheap, there are still going to be so many other issues to solve. With most of these issues really being in regards to the inefficiency of different lasers and inefficiency of energy extraction. But this doesn't change the fact that this is still an extremely intriguing and very important experiment. And if not for practical reasons, possibly for scientific reasons. It definitely can create opportunities to study what happens inside different stars and of course inside our sun as well. But more importantly, it serves as a proof that nuclear fusion on Earth is possible if we find a way to create an efficient laser-based system with relatively cheap to produce pellets. And as you know from history, every single major achievement and a lot of modern technology has always started with some sort of a really important experiment. So this right here is probably not an exception. Once the scientists are successful in achieving ignition, which will probably happen in a few years from now, it will definitely serve as a very important first step in achieving an actual nuclear fusion that we can use for clear energy. But I guess until future experiments, or until I come back and talk more about the other fusion experiment, the one that uses magnetic plasma, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Check out the links in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, and share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. Maybe support the channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Or maybe just stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.